come with us. Into the wild wood. And find the magic within. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and good night, good people around the world. This is Into the Wildwood, and today we're doing another book talk. Why? Because we read a shitload of books. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yep. And uh, if you have not done so, please go to the link in the description. And you'll find our link tree, you'll find a link to our website, into the wildwood.com with a wildwood with a Y. Um, and you, if you are so inclined, we would love your support. And you can leave us a donation there. You can also give us a thumbs up on this video. Leave us a comment as well. It helps to, uh, well, helps the YouTube algorithm and we can get more people chatting. Yeah. Right. All the things. All the things. Glad I don't have to rattle off all the things. No, I rattled off all the things <laughs> already. <laughs> if you got any other things you want to rattle off, go right ahead. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Then. All right. Let's get started. <laughs> all right. So, uh, what I've read this week, sorry, two weeks, because it's been two weeks since we did the last one. I read traditional Wicca, um, a Seeker's Guide by Thorn Mooney. And oh. uh, and hey, I'm not finished yet. Hang on, um, I am listening. I'm almost finished listening to. Hang on, I've got to, got to scroll through all my bloody script stuff. The Horn God of the <laughs> Witches by Jason Mankey. Should finish that today. And then those. Are, uh, I'm as I say, those yet. are both on my to read list. To read list. So I'm excited. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> the the Sorcerer's Crossing: A Woman's Journey by Tasha Abala. That one, and I've also read. See, this is why I said we like reading. <laughs> I also read *The Rebirth of, of Witchcraft* by Dorian Dorian Valiant. So yeah, there we go. There's I've read that one. <laughs> the last I, one, I, *The Rebirth you know, the, of Witchcraft*. The funny thing is, I have not never read it, um, mm. because when I began. I mean, these are all the type of books you kind of read at the beginning uh, mm. to get your foundation and whatnot. But mm -hmm. these books weren't available in this country, and we didn't have the internet, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm going through a bit of a uh, a nostalgic period, I suppose, of trying to get or getting hold of the books that I needed to read back then and couldn't. Yeah. Um, I've got quite a few on my list, actually. <laughs> well yeah i mean it's always good to go back and and fill in the holes and sometimes you don't know what the holes are for many many years yeah you know so i'm always doing that yeah yeah um all right so should, should we start with one of mine then yep yep go ahead all right let's do uh thorn mooney thorn mooney i i, I love thorn mooney i think she's fantastic um, she's got a YouTube channel and whatnot, and uh, talks about traditional wicker quite a lot. Um, and she's excellent. She really is. She knows her stuff. This book, traditional wicker, I don't think it was anything new to me, but I think it's an extremely necessary book um, because something I didn't realise, uh, but it gets brought up quite a lot in this is that a lot of people nowadays think that traditional wicca, initiatory wicca, has died and gone away. Really? Yeah. Um, oh. because, of all, because of all the neo wicca that's, <laughs> that's come about, and it's just... But there's, there's thousands of people. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Wow, okay. Um, <laughs> but it is this, the, you know, the whole neo wicca thing, where you become a solitary and you learn from the books, what we used to call book wicca or wiccanesque. Mm -hmm. That has become so prominent that people have completely and utterly disregarded and shut out traditional wicker. 
and wow. most of them don't even know what it is. Haven't even heard of it. Um, but it, it's she's got little sections in the book where she asks people in the outer court or other people um, that are not in her actual coven um, just to give a little bit like some feedback about a chapter or something like that. And it keeps coming up that people keep saying before I met Thorn or before I read something from Thorn, I thought traditional Wicca was dead. Uh, I didn't know there were any traditional Wiccans around. Great. That just blows my mind. I mean, I mean, I know a lot of traditional Wiccans, but just, yeah, wow, mm. that's crazy. Yeah. I guess it's not online as much. It's definitely not on no. TikTok, which I mean, TikTok is horrible, but <laughs> hmm, I don't know. Of course, back in the day, uh, you know, and Yahoo lists and that sort of thing, um, I belonged to Amber and Jet, which was, mm. you know, a meeting place for largely uh, traditional Wiccans, British traditional Wiccans. And of course, you know, people that were interested in it, wanted to find a coven kind of stuff, that, that was the public forum for that. And, you know, I, I've followed and kept in touch with a lot of those people, uh, wherever they went, Twitter, or Facebook, or, or whatever, you know. But, hmm, I just, mm. it, it kind of warps my brain to think <laughs> that, that pagans, our, our contemporary pagan community, for whatever that word means, would think that a vibrant living tradition that has thousands of people, like, you know, uh, and are still initiating people regularly. Mm -hmm. I, I regularly hear announcements of, you know, so-and-so was initiated or elevated, that sort of thing. I would think it was gone. No. Yeah. And, I, you know, if you think about it, back in our day, things like Doreen Valiant, um, Gerald Gardner's books, um, all of those are kind of like the books that people were talking about then. Mm -hmm. But now, if you ask somebody um, who's just coming into the path, witchcraft or whatever it is, um, they usually get directed to some kind of neo-pagan book. Um, and there's no mention of witchcraft in there or initiatory of witchcraft. There's sometimes discussion of Gerald Gardner created Wicca. That was it. You know, don't really go into too much history. Um, so there's no, I think there's a lack of mention of uh, initiatory Wicca and what it actually is and how it also differs from the Neo Wicca, uh, which yeah. Thorn goes, Thorn goes into a lot of the principles. For years here, I've taught a class, um, which which is which where it's just like an introduction to all these different terms and paths and what you can generally suss out that they mean you know and the clarification that people use labels individually and i i do have to go through usually quite intensely the difference between traditional witchcraft traditional wicca and the pop book wicca because those are usually all lumped together in people's minds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is also interesting about this book, and it, it's definitely not what I expected it to be. As I said, um, she goes in and discusses principles about Wicca um, quite in depth, and um, she is a, uh, a scholar, so it, it's really explained really, really well. But the book is actually for people who are looking for a coven. Hmm. And, well, that's good. We yeah. need books like that. Yeah. A lot of it goes into um, how to find people who are accepting an outer court, um, how to approach the coven. Um, you know, if you do not get a reply, it's probably, there's probably a good reason for it. Um, try again next year. Uh, so there's all these all these hints and tips about how to actually approach the coven in order to, you know, get them to consider you for application. 
um, because a lot of people will just think that they are the bee's knees and they go in and go, take me into your coven. Uh, that's not going to work. <laughs> or the people that show up and think it's like a Methodist church mm. that anyone should be able to attend whenever they want in any capacity they want, mm. you know, and I don't know how many people I've said, there's no spectators in witchcraft. You're in or you're out. <laughs> you don't have to be in forever, but when you come to do ritual, you participate. Mm. You know, that's the deal. But yeah, 20 years ago, I, I remember sitting around um, an unofficial table of local elders. And one of the things they lamented is um, nobody understands what the etiquette is to become a student, to become a coven member to, you know, more than just show up to public rituals, to join mm. a group of some sort. And uh, I remember, you know, them talking about somebody should really write this in books because that's now the primary method that people are learning. Even though they had come up um, before that, when it was like the Pagan Way material that was being mailed out was you know, the primo stuff, because that was the best that you could get. Mm. So, yeah, different, different times. So hopefully people are reading her work. And um, I assume she's talking about on YouTube. I haven't come across that particular topic from her, but. Um, I, don't, I haven't actually watched her stuff in quite a while. Um, I'm just checking the date that this was published. Because she does talk about Witch Fox, uh, which mm. unfortunately has gone. Yeah, that was pretty recent that Witch Fox ended. Mm. I'm sure somebody is going to step up and take their place. Uh, I mean... Well, I'll let the, the cat out of the bag. I am busy creating a social media site for witches. Um, it's going to be like Facebook, but it will also include blogs. Um, so I don't know if it'll take off. I'm just busy uh, putting it together at the moment, so I'll see where it goes. I don't know. And I'm going to add in things like events, uh, people who are open to accepting people in their covens and whatnot and such things. So. Yep. We shall yep. see. Uh, yeah, she wrote this 2018. I keep thinking that was last year, but it's not anymore, is it? <laughs> no, we're now out of Saturn in Aquarius, and we can think again. <laughs> that time just goes bloop and disappears, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it's like I was talking about... <laughs> I, I said to somebody 20 years ago, and I kept thinking that's 1980. It's like... Right? <laughs> I keep doing it. Yep. 10 years ago is 2005, 20 years ago is 1980, and last year is somewhere between 2015 and 2018. <laughs> yeah, actually, to get completely off topic, I did see a good one the other day. It was um, somebody had screen captured someone's uh, post and comment, and she was saying that, was it somebody who was born in... 2010 and it's now 2018 that makes them 18 years old <laughs> she was adamant <laughs> uh, sometimes maths just don't work <laughs> no <laughs> mm -hmm. all right so yes um i would i would actually re recommend this to anybody uh as i said it does focus a lot on um, somebody who's looking for a coven and how to do that. Um, but the, you know, the, the way she just, the scholarly approach she's taken to actually discussing the principles is excellent, really is. Um, so if anybody does want to understand traditional Wicca, then very good one. Um, because as I said, it wasn't what I was expecting because usually you pick up a book like this and it, it outlines the rituals. Um, it uh, goes into spell crafting. None of that in here. It really is the principles, um, the outer court, the inner court, uh, the different positions in, in a coven. So it, it's 
explaining a traditional Wiccan coven from start to finish and then how to actually get into one. Good. So, yeah. That's good. I mean, I think that's really needed. Um, mm. I remember, you know, back around the 2000s, um, uh, Amber Kay's Coven Craft and Dane McCoy's Inside a Witch's Coven were hot commodities uh, because mm. everybody wanted a coven. And these told you how to form them uh, from the ground up. Um, uh, even though both of those authors have since mm. been fairly discredited. Uh, mm. You know, this is what everyone was relying on. And Covencraft had, you know, forms to copy and, and that sort of thing. And bylaws that you could copy wholesale. And there were a lot of a lot of people forming covens based on those. And unfortunately, most of them didn't last because people were not actually spending time together to determine fit. You know, if they could build lasting bonds, if they were good friends, they were just getting together because they wanted a coven. And everybody, you know, went through the, the stages forming uh, where everybody's like, yeah, we're all alike. And, you know, let's do the thing. And then came the storming. Oh, wait, we're actually like different people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, all groups go through this process. And if there's not enough of a cohesion, if there's not a bond, if there's not, you know, something to hold you together, that storming part where everybody realizes we're different and we're different in some pretty significant ways often breaks a group apart. Mm -hmm. And I watched that happen again and again and again during that time. Um, and it, it was really a problem in the community mm -hmm. because, um, you know, those covens repeatedly breaking up, they were they were causing waves. They were splitting alliances and all sorts of things. And I was like, this this is not the way to do this. You know, <laughs> we got to do something different. People want to get together. People want to be part of covens. I think that's a really um, totally rational, logical, natural um, process for a lot of people in their spirituality and their religion is to do it in groups mm -hmm. you know and uh i don't i don't like that the answer is well you're stuck alone so now you're solitary i mean yes sometimes that is the situation temporarily but we should be solving the problem better than that because not everybody wants to be solitary and and not everybody is in one of those two states their entire path either. Mm. Well, I mean, not everybody wants to be in a group or a coven, so, you know, there's something True. for everybody. True. Um, but I think, I think, I think the biggest problem is that people, because I see it on my South African group, every now and again, somebody asks, are there any covens nearby? Um, but Firstly, they don't say what they're actually looking for. Yeah. And this was one thing that comes up in the book is, you know, I have a coven. Somebody comes along and says, I want to join your coven. Why do you want to join my coven? Do you even know what I do? You know, so, you know, there's covens for different things. It could be traditional witchcraft. It could be demonolatry. It could be Wicca. It could be traditional Wicca. So there's all these different things. So, you know, the best way to approach is to say, I am looking for a coven where I can learn um, whatever it is, Wicca, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know much about what you do. Could you please explain it to me just to make sure that, you know, we would be compatible, you know, a respectful, not just throwing yourself out there going, I want to be part of a coven. Yeah. yeah. Well, or um, I've seen people come on groups and be like, where's the list of covens for the area? Mm. No, that's mm -mm. <laughs> that's not a thing. Cherry pick them. <laughs> right. Uh, but again, that's why I say treating it like it's a Methodist church. Mm. You know, 
um, it, it, it's that sort of, sort of attitude. And I've had people, um, you know, back when I was the contact person for a coven that was taking new members, I had a lot of people get very upset with me when, you know, after a very brief conversation, I'd be like, hey, I don't think we're a good fit. We have some real big differences here. Um, you know, thanks for your time. Have a great day. Nice to meet you. Kind of thing, mm -hmm. which it happens. You're going to meet people that, like you said, aren't even on the same path. Mm -hmm. If they want to practice traditional witchcraft and, and you're practicing Dianic Wicca, <laughs> it's not a good fit. It doesn't yeah. mean you can't be friends and you can't be cordial and everything else. You're just not going to do deep magic together, mm -hmm. you know? And so I used to explain it to people that, you know, joining a coven is like getting married into a family. This is a big commitment. You don't just show up and ask, where are the families that have people I could marry? Mm -hmm. That's weird. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, you meet I, people, you have similar interests, you get to know people. Yeah. I think the other part of that is that even if you do, because, I mean, she was talking about outer court. Um, so people come into the outer court and they start getting trained. And over that period, you may find that the person's energy just doesn't click with oh, the rest of the coven. And to bring them into the inner inner court, it would just basically blow everything up and you right. know, that would be it. Thanks, have a good day. Um, so even in a situation like that, it doesn't mean that you're going to get into the inner court and it's not anything against you. And I think, you know, as you said, you kind of... Um, say that you know this isn't going to be a good fit and then they get upset because they immediately feel rejected it's not rejection right. it's just that it won't work yeah well mm -hmm. i mean i i went through training with the gardenarian coven but i was not initiated because i was not a good fit for that group and it wasn't any kind of animosity it wasn't anything it was just readily apparent to everyone in the room mm -hmm. i did not belong one of these things is not like the other you know, <laughs> that's all it was. And, you know, we happily parted ways, that sort of thing. But it, it happens. And it happens more often than you think. Mm. And it is not, um, it is not like a church. It doesn't, it, covens and kindreds don't just take all comers. They are mm. small groups. They are family type dynamics because they're very small and they're doing magic together yeah and you know that's like that's as intimate as having sex with someone on that that level of vulnerability and trust and emotional connection that's required mm -hmm. so not taking all comers <laughs> you know uh that's not the way most people are approaching their spirituality, their religion, their magic practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So that's that book. So I'm rattling on for about 20 minutes, about one book. We've got lots to get <laughs> through. <okay. laughs> All right. What's one of yours? Um, this past couple of weeks, I read, listened to uh, The Alchemy of Psychology by James Hillman. Uh, I've been uh, studying uh, more and more of Rick Levine's work, and he mentions Hillman a lot. And I'm like, oh, I should, I should go brush up on that. And um, the Alchemy of Psychology is actually Hillman's lectures at a weekend conference of of the same name. So listening to it, it's really fascinating because he introduces a topic, and then all of the um, the professionals in the audience bring up their thoughts and their questions and everything else. And you get to really hear um, a dialogue and a conversation from the alchemist, astrologer, psychology professionals that are all mm -hmm. interested in this subject. So um, this is one where the audiobook is way better than the print because there's inflection, there's tone. This was originally a lecture. But um, this is um, one of those foundational uh, books. 
um, that I, I read as a print book back in the day, um, and the audiobook's way better. Uh, but if you um, grew up in Christianity and are now interested in uh, witchcraft or magic of any kind, you should read this. Um, if you're interested in astrology, alchemy, psychology, or uh, therapy, you should read this. <laughs> if you do work with Kabbalah, you should read this. <laughs> it's, it's just, he unpacks, he makes the link between the opaque alchemical language and uh, through Freud and Jung to modern psychology and kind of a little bit into depth psychology too. Um, so he draws those lines together, not in a prescriptive, this is what this means, this is what this means, but in, you know, the good old fashioned uh, storytelling style of Campbell, where he pulls together several different threads and is like, this is why I think this is what this means. And then everybody talks about it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, maybe this, well, maybe this, well, how about this? So the ideas are presented, but they're not presented in such a way that you pick them up as dogmas because they are immediately challenged as soon as they are presented. They're mm -hmm. immediately buffeted. So I think that's a wonderful way to learn about something as um, self-referential as psychology. You know, um, in science, Western science, at least the scientific method always wants to remove the observer, remove the, the human variable. And now that we're into the quantum world, we realize that's not a thing. Um, there's a wave particle duality and it's all about us. Uh, so studying psychology is very difficult because to remove the human element is to remove everything. It's all the human element. That's what you're studying. And it's very easy to externalize all of this and be like, that's psychology, not realizing that the concepts you're studying are influencing your own psychology without your awareness if, you, if you're not aware of it. So studying in um, the, you know, didactic questioning method, I think is uh, very, very valuable to something like psychology. And of course that extends over to astrology because for the vast majority of people, um, the bulk of the astrological information that they read is psychological. It's about personality and interpreting the self and that sort of thing. Um, of course, not where I got started. I, I can't seem to put my foot in the regular pool to start things. <laughs> I started my, my magic life with Crowley. I started my astrology life with uh, orary <laughs> and, and concrete astrology that, that was like, there's nothing to do with your personality in here. It just says you're tall and you're going to get fat. You know? <laughs> you <know>? So... <laughs> Very different view on what astrology could be. Mm. Is the <laughs> but, audio book the audio book the actual conference or is it? The audio book is the recordings of the actual conference. Oh no. Nice. Um, yeah. And my only complaint is the audience speakers aren't mic'd, so mm. you have to like fuck with the volume to hear a few of them. And luckily on the second day they come back, every time somebody says something, uh, Hillman is like, stand up and speak loud. So the recording picks you up, you know, and then you can, you can hear them a bit better. <laughs> but that first day I, I was there with the, the volume control being like, okay, now turn it down. Cause he's going to talk. And <laughs> well, it really makes but, you concentrate on the book. Then. <laughs> true. True. But even with all of that, I think it's absolutely worth it to listen to the audiobook because of the additional intonation pauses and everything that just don't translate to text, mm. when, especially when it's originally a spoken medium. Mm. I think, as you said, it's very important that um, you get to hear kind of the process of taking a, a theory to pieces uh, mm -hmm. from, from all different angles, um, because usually we read a book and it's the author's perspective on things and it's only the author's perspective. Um, it's, so, yeah. 
Yeah, it's not a method of communication of information that we find frequently. Mm -hmm. It's it's just the author's perspective in most books. And that is the expectation in a book. Um, I think if somebody were to publish a book today without preface and were to like write their ideas and then dissect it and take it apart with each idea, people would think that it was a bad book. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, what, what is the author really saying? You know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. But yep. Hillman is foundational in psychology. I'm sure anybody who's studying psychology has read James Hillman. And um, this goes along with his actual book um, that was written as a book, uh, The Soul's Code, which is also all about that alchemical language and that sort of thing. And he really focuses on color. That's kind of his... Um, his method he chose to categorize things. Mm. And so this really unpacked a bunch of color theory and language around color in the alchemical sense, but in, in many other ways too. And one thing I really appreciated about it is because of the questioning method, it's not like when you're reading and the author says, think of da-da-da-da, and you can just skip it. He goes, you know, he's like, think of all the colors of green. And then it's just silence for a little while. Well, you really do think of all of the colors of green. You have no choice. You can't just skip ahead. You can't just miss these exercises in the book because they're set off to the side. So, again, it's the, it's the method of delivery of the information. The information is very important, too. But... I don't know. I guess that's my thing lately. That was my thing about Dale Pendle's books, too. It's the <laughs> method of delivery. <laughs> well, I think it's important because we are, I think we have kind of gotten into a flow of things, you know. This is how a book's written. This is how it's read. Let's not divert because otherwise we can't get enough stuff out to make enough money. Um, yeah. You know. And I really have been thinking a lot about um, the structure of books, because I find that's the best way to recommend books to people. Mm. We all have our structures and our forms of information that we like and that we can understand. And uh, we want to read books or consume content in that form. You know, some people mm. like audio way better. Some people like video way better. Some people like to read print books. But even within that, there are structures and forms and ways of communicating information. Yeah. Yeah. All right, should we go on to one that we've both read? Sure. All right, The Rebirth of Witchcraft. Oh, wait, there was another book. Uh, Gemma Gary's Traditional Witchcraft Cornish Book of Ways. That oh, yeah. One. I knew there was another book. Um. You've read that one as well. Mm -hmm. she has Not as long that. ago as I read Valiente's book, but yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about that one because I had some notes. Okay. Of course, my tablets decided to. So I gotta, pull. I gotta pull it up so I can see the illustrations, and then my mind will remember the content because that's how my my head works. But I'm just trying to find it. Uh, here we go. It's the I one did, with the red cover, right? Yeah. Yeah. I did enjoy the book. It was absolutely amazing and lovely and fantastic. There were just a couple of things. Um, I had a bit of difficulty with was one. She starts talking about. Get to my bookmark here. Yeah. Uh, um, she starts talking about taking um, a branch from a tree or a wand or a staff or something like that and it really is just tying something a, a ribbon around where you want to cut it and then going away and coming back the next day and cutting it hmm 
Um, I'll just check. When, you, when deciding to harvest such wood, it is good practice to let the tree know that you intend to take that particular branch, tie a piece of string around where you intend to make the cut, and leave it there for a week or so, letting the tree, oh. get, used, letting the tree get used to the idea. So it's not, you know, you've decided, you're telling the tree, and then you let the tree get used to the idea. It's not a case of, you know, asking the tree if you can. <laughs> <laughs> to leave some things out there but i don't know i didn't i guess i filled in the missing uh bits in my mind myself yeah well i because, did that's all, but that's yeah. literally what it says yeah yeah because i mean you go you make offerings you ask permission you get permission but then this practice is um it's tying off the uh, spirit of the tree so that it severs its spirit at that point and what chooses to live in the wand with you may stay and what chooses to live in the tree may stay and it's allowing time for that separation mm. um, like tourniqueting a limb before amputating you know mm. but yeah, I, it's been many years since I read it, but um, yeah, I can see how she might not actually say that in there. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's quite possible that she didn't even think about it herself because as you said you filled in the missing blank. So when you're writing, you just, you don't think about... This often, is the practice. Yeah. yeah. And that is the praxis. Yeah. You know, but... Unfortunately, the she does say so the tree can get used to it, which... Yeah, that that fills in all that bit I explained to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but, yeah, to somebody who who is quite new to this, right? They wouldn't even know to make offerings. They wouldn't know to ask permission and get permission. It's just tie a string where you want to cut it. Tell the tree that you're going to cut it at some stage, and then go off for a week or so. Come back and chop it. Okay. And um, she doesn't explain how tight to tie it or any of that stuff either. No. Because no. it really is um, a tourniquet process. Um, usually you tie it, you know, loose enough that it can spin around the branch. You don't want to impinge on the bark and um, ask, is this okay? We all cool with this, you know, kind mm. of thing. Um, and then when you come back, you you tighten it significantly. You want to to pinch that bark off because that's where the blood of the tree flows. That's where mm -hmm. the sap flows. And depending upon time of year or type of tree and, and thickness of bark, um, you may need to leave it tight for a while before you cut because you don't want to injure the tree. You don't want to cause damage, mm -hmm. you know? Um, just like any other living being's body going to be doing surgery and cutting bits off and, and granted plants are designed to have bits come off. Humans are not, but <laughs> you know, well, our dead bits only come off at a later stage. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is still a process to this. There is still an honoring of the, the physical form of the, of the tree and the spirit of the tree too. Mm. Um, the other part was I know it's a, a bit of a, an issue for you um, is that whenever she talks about the cauldron she talks about putting charcoal in the cauldron and burning stuff uh -huh. in it yeah yeah, yeah. I was well, reading that I'm thinking oh Kai <laughs> <laughs> I got my own pet peeves but you know I've long ago <laughs> accepted different traditions yeah. many different traditions because uh, I don't know how many rituals I've been to where they're burning charcoal at a little cauldron and I'm just like that's gross soup I'm not <laughs> eating that <laughs> they look at me like I'm insane you, know, uh, you put nasty ass fire into your soup pot with frankincense I'm not eating that either that mm. Mm. <laughs> yep yep <laughs> Only for peptic ulcers. 
but it, it is good. it is a really good book. Um, I think anybody who wants to kind of um, get a different perspective on traditional witchcraft, where it's practiced in a particular area, being uh, Cornwall, Devon. Um, yeah. You know, there and are some, obviously some differences in the spirits themselves as well. That's the thing. Traditional witchcraft is very, very local. Mm. It's so connected with the land that, you know, this group practicing here and this group 100 miles away practicing here have different traditions mm. because their land is going to be different. And, you know, and, and Jim McGarry writes about Cornish witchcraft mm. from Cornwall. That's it, you know, and that's plenty. It's a, an entirely rich tradition, but I think in our modern times on our internet with access to so much information, um, we're always looking for the most universal right answer. Yeah. And it's something you just, you really gotta let go of in traditional witchcraft, especially because mm. the most universal is not the right answer because it is the most universal mm. it can be a starting place it can be a place to learn from but it's never going to be the right answer for anyone because it's not attached to the land you have although, to take it in you know, although at the same time i mean if somebody was born in cornwall and they grew up in cornwall and then they moved to the us or south africa um you know there's a I think a bit of an overlap that happens because you have to obviously get in contact with the land that you, where you are, but you've still oh, got absolutely. those roots. So, you know, for anybody who was born in Cornwall, Devon, uh, I used to go, when I was a kid, we used to go to Cornwall, Devon often on holidays, loved it. Um, but anybody who's born there, you know, they can still read something like this and find out what those connections were or are. Absolutely. Um, and contact those those particular spirits yeah. yeah and of course you're going to to work that from afar if you're somewhere else and over time your craft will morph to be that blend of you and the land mm. i mean if you're doing your craft your craft will morph to be a blend of you and the land mm. <laughs> that's just the way it works you know so no matter where you are it's going to affect and change how you practice it. Mm. There was actually something interesting on one of Peter Padden's podcasts about he he started traveling and he did a every now and again he did a series um, or podcast which was connecting with the land. Mm -hmm. And I remember he was explaining that he was he connected with the land. He was in Japan at the time. He connected with the land and he could he could sense the spirits in Japan. And then it kind of, he kind of went lower and deeper into the land. And eventually he could actually connect with the spirits of his land, of his, of his personal practice. Um, so it's kind of layers upon layers as well, which yeah. is quite interesting. Mm. Well, on one hand, I, I feel, and again, this is all totally UPG. The deeper you go, the older they are, mm. you know, and the older they are, the bigger and more connections they have. That's just the way growth works. Mm. But also there's the the cultural layers that are deposited by people energetically and below the cultural layer, when you get down below the people spot, there is what I call the fungus layer. It's like the great huge networks of mycelium that cross continents and oceans. Mm -hmm. You know, when we say underground, under, you know, the deepest points on earth, these these huge living, I, I think of them like um, synapses that pass electrical impulses or blood vessels that sort of thing. And that layer, you can go anywhere. Mm. You can connect to anything because everything is eventually tapped into that layer somehow. Mm. 
you know, everything is connected. Yeah. And most trees are tapped into that layer. Mm. That's part of the reason trees are so vitally important in so many, you know, earth-centered religions is they've got the connections and, and an antenna that sticks right up into our world that's very easy to connect to. <laughs> you know, they they can help you get there. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, all right, let's go on. Have you got another one? Um, actually, speaking of Peter Padden, I went back and read um, his uh, grimoire for the modern crafter. I need to that's read that again for the fourth time, I think. <laughs> I think that's what the name of it is. I don't remember. It's a long name, but <laughs> it, I, it's a short little booklet. And um, again, it's a great introduction to... Padden's traditional craft, just like uh, Jim McGarry's book is, mm. uh, full of praxis, full of ideas, um, sketches for ritual because it's not a, a thing you read out loud, uh, kind of stuff. And um, I think it's a really good companion to the podcast, of course, because he talks about so much more in the podcast. And the grimoire is kind of like taking that body of work and condensing it and organizing it. Mm -hmm. Now, there is also a collected podcast of the Crooked Path book that is transcripts of the podcast. But again, I find that hard to read because it's the audio to text format and it reads kind of funny. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the grimoire I like because you can use it as a reference book. Everything is well labeled in the table of contents. It's logically laid out. You're like, oh, I just want to read about summer solstice. Mm. And you just read that little section. You know, it, it doesn't have to be read all at once, mm. which is handy. I think I think uh, many of his books were that audio to text uh, mm -hmm. translation because I think it was visual magic. Um. But it did read like, because he actually mentions um, that it was a, a class that he taught. So mm -hmm. I think he recorded it at some stage and then just you know, kind of transcribed it directly. Well, he was, he was a pretty early pioneer in video classes. Like, mm -hmm. wasn't he back when sending VHS through the mail that you could buy his video classes? I don't know about or that. Or am I too yeah. early in technology for that? I remember them on DVD. And you can still get them DVD. on DVD. That's what yeah. he says. They're on DVD, not VHS. Yeah. Yeah, but still, it was a physical item through the mail to get your movie. Mm. Instead of logging on to somewhere and, and clicking into a Vimeo video or something like that. Um, mm. Because there was internet back then, but we basically just had email. It was still dial-up. So you couldn't stream movies. But no. yeah, I remember he was kind of kind of pioneering in that format of teaching the craft through a video. Mm. I think he actually inspired me to do my because uh, for a short period I did the um, that was a Kabbalistic meditation DVD. Um, I started selling. That was quite fun actually. <laughs> I still remember that. Yeah. But you can still get his DVDs on Amazon, though. Yeah, oh, that's Craft, good. Craftwise DVDs. That's right, Craftwise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, excellent book. We both recommend that one. Definitely recommend that. Yeah, and yeah. it's a very quick read. You could you could read it in a weekend, even if you're not a big reader. Mm. Um. Okay, let's go on to Jason Mankey. Because I'm still, well, I'm still, I'm almost finished. I should actually be finished with this today. Uh, yeah, I've got 13 minutes left. Um, <laughs> I, I hate it when I stop a book like that. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I listen. To, this is an audio book, so I listen to it on the way to the shopping bag. So when I get back, mm -hmm. I, I stop it. You know, I right. don't check how much time I got left. Um, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant book. The horn, horn god of the witches. 
Um, and I say brilliant because he has gone into such in-depth study of the Horn God from all different angles. He does focus on Pan and Kurninos, um, but he he explores Azazel, he explores, um, I think he explores uh, Shiva um, in this aspect. It's the, the horned and the phallic god, um, but he also mm-hmm. explains it from uh, the point of view of the goat horns and the antlered god. Um, you know, the antlered god sheds the horns once a year so that they grow back, so there's a whole death and birth process. Um, but what was, I think what really got me and I haven't heard anybody else discuss this. Um, Pan, we often consider Pan to be the translation of the Greek word Pan, which means all. So it gets associated with Baphomet. And this is where my association, my association of Pan comes in. It is that all-encompassing spirit. But originally, it was Pan, which meant shepherd. Um, and it was only later that the whole idea of the Greek pan and all actually started coming in so originally it was pan and shepherd and then it became pan and all so there's an old history there that i haven't heard anybody else speak of interesting um, i've never heard that either yeah so hmm. he really really does he's that's very very in-depth study of the horn god and that's, that's brilliant absolutely brilliant Actually, there was a really interesting idea. I'd never heard about Pan in the alchemy of psychology. Um, Discussing, you know, the basic alchemical elements, uh, salt, sulfur, and mercury. And um, most of the alchemical elements we can map onto planets, right? Mm. It's very, mercury is mercury. Uh, The moon is silver, the sun is gold, all of this. And, And... the language of transmutation is often communicated in these and salt is is salt it belongs to the earth right Mm -hmm. um that's where salt comes from and but then we've got sulfur and and what is that sulfur is passion it's igniting it's something that's always ready to burn it's so ready to burn it's burning the air it's burning your nostrils it's Mm -hmm. volatile and it doesn't map to any planets or anything and somebody was like well that's pan and you could, you know, you could hear a pin drop as everybody's spines went. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. But, wow, I'd never thought of that. Mm-hmm. Of, you know, Pan being that volatile, passionate force that is always right there and ready. Ready mm-hmm. to, to transform, ready to consummate, ready to join, ready to do the thing. You know, and a lot of people are aware that's Mars, but that's not, no, that's not Mars. Mm. So I, I, that really uh, started some gears turning in my head, thinking about that, how mm. that works in a lot of alchemical writings. That's interesting. Mm. All right, so there's that book. Definitely go read it. Um, he goes into, as I said, everything. He goes into Hearn. And some interesting history about her that I didn't know. It it, it probably originated from um, I've forgotten the guy's name. I think it was John Horn. Um, and Hearn is more about retribution. Um, and getting hung on the tree, the oak tree, in whatever park it was. Uh, so really, really good history in there, uh, but extensively explored. So. Well, um, the other books I've been reading are all astrology books. <laughs> okay. Um, although, if you're interested in learning predictive astrology, you should read Predictive Astrology by Bernadette Brady. Um, it's absolutely, uh, you know, the cornerstone handbook to turn to. And uh, while I'm not a fan of modern rulerships and um, that sort of thing. Still super interesting. And it's about the technique, uh, even though she uses modern rulerships and and comes to some conclusions where I look at the chart and go, nah. Uh, But, you know, astrology is holographic. That's That's the thing. Because the universe is holographic and we're reading holographic mathematical sacred geometry. So, 
you can slice and dice it and still get the same answer, uh, which always puzzles people about astrology. They want to know, is this the right form? Is this the right form? Is this the right form? Because it, it looks like math. So we think there's a right and wrong answer. But, you know, once we understand that wave particle duality, and I mean, there's, there's a very um, prescient theory that the planets are only there because we look at them, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? They're, they're the coalescence, especially when we start talking about some of the ideas around the Uranians and that sort of stuff that they aren't there. They're mathematical points. And there's all sorts of mathematical points in astrology. But anyways, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> my point is astrology is fractal because we're studying the universe and the universe is fractal. And because of that, um, the, the fractal nature, the holographic nature, multiple astrologies can look at the same chart and go different ways and end up at the same answer. Um, so, you know, the difference between using modern rulerships and not using modern rulerships or using a sidereal um, zodiac or a tropical zodiac or, you know, all those sorts of things. If you're really doing the techniques within the paradigm that they work in, you're all going to arrive at the same answers. Mm. Yep. And then okay. I, I've been devouring Vadius Valens anthology too, but that's probably even way more. I mean, it's Valens. It's it's barely in English. It's it's translated from Latin into modern English. So of course I'm reading different translators because a new translation just came out with lots of illustrations, which is nice. Although um, there was a, a a common thing in astrology that if you want to learn astrology, you do a thousand charts. And one of the jokes is just calculate all the charts in Balin's anthology. <laughs> You, mm-hmm. If you work through and hand calculate everything he mentions and actually do it, do the work yourself, you'll, you'll be an astrologer by the end of it because it's huge. <laughs> 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 and I wish I could say I've done that, but I, not mm-hmm. every single one. I, I've been curious about some of them and worked them out and, and that sort of thing. or have been like, I should really study this, but mm-hmm. not front to back every single one. <laughs> All right. Well, that's all over my head, so I can't even discuss it. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. Good book recommendations for anybody who does want to actually get into that. Right. I'm going to quickly talk about this one, and then we'll have a, a bit of a chat about uh, Dorian Valiant, uh, Rebirth of Witch, whichever that one is. Yeah, okay. Rebirth of so, Witchcraft. Yeah. Taisha Abelard's book, Sorcerer's Crossing. Now, if you are into Castaneda, Carlos Castaneda and the Toltec Warrior Pass, you've got to read this book. It's absolutely necessary. For one very good reason, Castaneda is not even mentioned in this book. Every other book about the Toltec Warrior Pass talks about Castaneda. Even Victor Sanchez, who diverts away from actual Castaneda himself, talks about Castaneda. This goes into the Toltec warrior path from, from a party of warriors who only later become associated with Castaneda because it's only later when Don Juan's gone um, that Castaneda becomes the Nagual. And it's right at the end of the book, of this book, that she has a vision of a group of people who are at a gathering and there's one man who's like um, charismatic and everything else. And, she asks um, the what is his name, no, the person who was guiding her through the through the visions and whatnot, who's that man? And he said he will be the next Nagual. He will be your Nagual. Um, so it wasn't. It was a vision of the future, but doesn't even say his name. So and it 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 explains. It goes into recapitulation a lot. Uh, it goes into the magical passes, it goes into um, stepping uh, beyond the worlds. 
Um, it goes into uh, the Shadow World. It's just, it goes into all of the practices within Toltec Warrior Path, but explain more practically than Castaneda ever did. <laughs> um, so, yeah. If anybody's interested in Castaneda, you have to read that. That's an absolute must. Right. I so, did listen to some Terrence McKenna lectures this week, but mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you names or where they were from. It was just, I have all of the the speakings of Terrence McKenna saved in a YouTube playlist, and I like to listen to them. <laughs> <It's so wild. laughs> and I, I gotta say, if you're if you're using plants in your craft, um, like you know, actually communing with the plant spirits you should you should listen to and read terence mckenna um because mm. he really has um a wonderful perspective i think to add to uh the facets of understanding of how humans and plants communicate well, definitely something i need to read or listen to i haven't actually listened to any terence mckenna i think i think listening to is better um because he's given lots and lots of lectures and radio shows and that sort of thing and again it's inflection it's delivery uh you know there's a lot of information that's communicated in tonality and pacing that just aren't there in the text so he's another one that i would say you should listen to it instead of read it are his audiobooks very much sort of sitting in front of a crowd of people or something um, somebody else? yeah usually yeah, because yeah. most of the stuff he was he was traveling and lecturing, um, you know, back when we had cassettes mm. and, and that sort of thing. And that's what a lot of his works are that are now available uh, audio wise are recordings of these lectures because people very quickly realized you got to come listen to this guy speak, mm. you know, Um so people were making recordings of his lectures and passing them around on cassettes and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, so the audio quality ain't great, but it improved over time. Mm. Um, but that's what a lot of the audio books are out there, are the, the collections of his lectures, which I think is a really valuable resource, you mm. know? Yeah, it is. I think I'm actually thinking of uh, Ram Das. He also did that. Oh, um, yeah. You know, where he was giving his lectures and they were recorded and now they're you know, getting on scribes audio books. Yep. So. Yep. Yeah, I've been been listening to Ram Das through mm. Rick Levine again. Um Rick Levine had a lot of interaction with Ram Das and talks about him frequently. So I started studying his birth chart and then I was like, I have to go read what this guy says because look at that. Mm. <laughs> All right. The Rebirth of Witchcraft by Doreen Valiente or Doreen Valiente. People, I say Doreen Valiente. I don't know. Yeah, I never I've, thought about it. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Um, I love the book. Absolutely love it. I, and, you know, it's a brilliant resource for history of how witchcraft actually kind of developed. But the fact mm -hmm. that Doreen herself was closely in close relation with Gardner and then Cochrane and all these other people. Well, and Sanders and Dafo and Sybil Leak and I she mean she never met Sanders. That's she right. She never yeah. met Sanders, but she was she was there at the time of the controversy. Yeah, yeah. Even though she was not she she was not involved with Sanders, but she was present and or in contact with so many of these people mm. that are, I mean, I, she is also one of the foundations of modern Wicca, but she was writing about it at the time too. Mm. But it's just those the, the personal interaction and the personal stories that come through. And, mm. you know, what I, I think what I like most about it was that when you read somebody's personal interaction with like somebody who was in Gardner's Coven and was initiated by Gardner and had this close relationship with them, um, often they kind of put the person on the pedestal. Hmm. But she doesn't. 
she pulls apart all of his all of the problems he had um you know when he started talking to the press how he just went way overboard and just became a bit of an arsehole really um but at the end Perhaps. says absolutely loved i love loved gerald gardner you mm-hmm. know so they still had that relationship you yeah you can tell that she is um interested in continuing the flame of the craft not mm. in a cult of personality mm. she's serving the craft it's very clear and it, it comes through in her work it especially comes through in her poetry you know um but but like you said she doesn't put anybody up on a pedestal yeah. anyone you know she's well aware that everyone involved here are humans and they have their flaws and uh she's not afraid to address and deal with that mm. um i think one of the most interesting characters i found in the book was this uh nicholas breakspear um it's the oh the that which she channeled. The, yeah the i i I thought very familiar, but yeah, it was the one she channeled. Mm. It's been a while it's... since I read it. I'm sure you know <laughs> the details better than I at this point. I think it's been 15 years. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's when I should have read it, you see. <laughs> <laughs> but then we wouldn't be talking about it now, I suppose. So right. It's a good thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I found that absolutely fascinating because it was... You know, it was information channeled from a time which was way before any of the mm-hmm. any of the modern uh, witches that actually brought modern witchcraft back, uh, or brought witchcraft back into the modern era. And the the similarities, as much as the differences, uh, to what we practice now. Um, so, kind of like get some little hints from there, you know. Um, what was that? I think it was in, in this chapter. And what was interesting, they they never they they called the the horn god the old one, uh, yeah. but it was never he was never referred to as the horn god, which is kind of interesting if you consider well, if you consider Ma- Mankey's book about the history and everything. Um, oh, I was thinking of the poem from Macbeth. Black spirits and white, red spirits and grey, come ye, come ye, come ye, that may. Throughout and about, around and around, the circle would be drawn, the circle would be bound, but that was from Macbeth. Um, so yeah, I heard that quite a bit. So um, I'm not sure if that's where the, the throughout, without, throughout and about chant came from, or if she's incorporating like a traditional one into that or if it really was the tout 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 about uh mm. first and that's not an accent that happens but lots of good little gems in there like that little mm. bits to pick up yeah because i think that the uh, the thout and tout come from french i'm not sure because i was i was trying to find it at some stage and all it came up with was um french to english so. Mm, I think it's uh, um, it's uh, accent over an English poem. I don't think it was ever French. I think mm. it's dr- saying it quickly, hearing it with an accent, dropping uh, syllables, that sort of thing that happens with chants. Mm. Toot to toot toot. Yeah. It's easier to say toot to toot toot than thout at out out. No, it's not. <laughs> okay. Toot toot There you go. <laughs> tout tout tout. Um, <laughs> depends on which vowel sounds you were raised in, in which language. Well, it's through it in a bit. See, I'm not Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a boot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Um, all right, so good book. Go read it. Don't argue. <laughs> <laughs> Don't argue. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think I think what what's important about this book is that it is about the history of witchcraft. Um, and when we think about the history of witchcraft, people's minds immediate, immediately go to the old woman in the forest. And then Gerald Gardner did this, and Cochrane did this. But this goes into British, how it, how it developed mm-hmm. through Britain, and mm-hmm. the troubles that they had with the police, uh, with the law, um, with... Um, satanic cults that were doing things under the name of witchcraft, uh, which were questionable, like killing babies. Um, I think anybody actually did that, but yeah, it was, I do was remember a whole the story. Yeah, I do remember the 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 sensationalism in the media and the police being involved. Mm. I mean, a lot of the cases, the police said there's no grounds for any any of the claims that are being made. Right. Um, and eventually, in one of the cases where oh, it was to do with, was it Sybil Leak? Um, there was a group going around desecrating the churches. And, oh, yeah. yeah and there was they some, blamed her coven because she was public. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, I have to go find it now. It was something to do with um, she went to go. Um, she went posing as a reporter or something to see what it what it was about, and there was Tevin script written on on one of the doors, so anybody else everybody else couldn't read it. She could read it, and it was actually honouring her. Um, so I think that's probably where the the story of her being blamed for the whole thing came from. Hmm. Um, but yeah, the, just. Very, very important and interesting history, and it, not just of the old witch in the forest. You know, this is actual things. Yeah, happen. not fairy tale history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, go get that one as well. I would say, along with this, you should read Fire Fire Child. Um, that's Maxine Sanders' account of her life as a witch, Ooh, yeah. and um. Same time period, same area, but obviously uh, different people because uh, her most of what she talks about is is Alex Sanders and what was going on there. But mm. it's a, a you know good to go along with this uh, because it it talks about all the same same people, same stuff happening, but from another perspective. Mm. Sure, read that one. Yeah, and I think that brings us to the end of. Book talk for today. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So as all as well as last time, as always, because we've just only the second time we've done this. Um, the list of books will be in the description on YouTube and also on the podcast. So you can go and have a look at the titles and the authors there. And that's it for today. So let us know what you've been reading. Yes. And yeah. if you have thoughts on any of these books, please share them with us, uh, whether that's in the comments section on YouTube or come join our Discord server, The Wildwood Temple, or find us on Facebook in a group called The Wildwood Temple. And I'm sure all those links are in the description of whatever you're watching or listening to. Yeah, they're in the link tree, so they're all in there. Uh, yeah, that was your turn to go on about My turn to have the brain. <laughs> all right and we will see you next week have a good one for now and tally ho bye bye